Quake, one of the most influential games ever released for the PC. Some have even claimed that it was largely responsible for the downfall of Cyrix in the home computer market due to it running poorly on their processors. The reason being that it was highly optimized for Intel's Pentium P5 architecture. This also meant that Quake didn't perform as well on AMD's K5 and K6 processors. So why did Quake perform so well on the Pentium? Or maybe a better question is, why did Quake perform poorly on the other architectures? This video will explore this from a computer architecture perspective, since the reason behind it is quite interesting. Let's begin by taking a trip back to 1996, where the PC marketplace was dominated by the 32-bit x86 processors. At the time, the widely successful 486 processor was 7 years old. Intel's follow-up processor, the Pentium, had been on the market for 3 years, Cyrix's 5x86 and 6x86 had been on the market for about a year, and AMD just released their new K5 processor featuring out-of-order execution. A year later, in 1997, both Intel and AMD would release their follow-up processors the Intel Pentium MMX and the AMD K6. Enter, id, Software, a game development company who was just about to release a new game that would shake up the market. That game was Quake. They had previously published two hit titles, Wolfenstein 3D in 1992, and Doom in 1993. Both games were written targeting the now ubiquitous 486 processor. However, they wanted to break ground with their newest title. To do so, they would have to go beyond the outdated 486 processor and look to the future. Given that development of their next title likely began around 1994, their only option going forward was Intel's recently released Pentium processor. The processor boasted substantial performance improvements over the 486, and they would need to utilize every ounce of it. The optimizations used really paid off, as can be seen in the Quake benchmark. These numbers are in frames per second for 320 by 200 software rendering. The Pentium MMX233, the AMD K6233, and the Cyrix 6x86233 have all been marked, since they should all have the same clock speed. However, we can see that there is a 9 frames per second difference between the 6x86 and the K6, and then again between the K6 and the Pentium. While the Cyrix 5x86 and 6x86 are relevant contenders, I am going to focus mainly on the AMD K6, since it has the most information available. That said, why was there such a large difference in performance between the Pentium and the K6? While any answer must be architectural, or more specifically, how the code was executing on the specific architecture, there is a question of narrowing down the source of the difference. We know that the performance difference between the K6 and the Pentium wasn't that large in general, so was this something specific with Quake, or was it related to the software renderer? To answer this, we should begin by looking at the four main optimizations used by Quake when targeting the Pentium. The first was the heavy usage of the floating point exchange instruction, which was required to mitigate a performance mess caused by the x87 floating point extensions. The second was the superscalar execution of the Pentium processor, which meant that it could execute up to two integer instructions in parallel. This is compared to one instruction in the 486. The third was the well established pipeline floating point unit of the Pentium. This allowed for better throughput of floating point instructions on the Pentium when compared to the 486, which used a floating point coprocessor model. And finally, there was the exploitation of an optimization made in the Pentium, which allowed for floating point division operations to overlap partially with the execution of integer instructions. It's easy to see why Quake performed well on the Pentium compared to the 486, but surely the other processors released afterwards could do some of these things too. Looking at the optimizations utilized on the Pentium, we can see that many of them are also utilized on the AMD K6. The K6 is capable of two-way superscalar execution, has a pipeline floating point unit, mostly, and the K6 can overlap integer and floating point instructions. The only optimization which the K6 did not implement was the floating point exchange instruction pairing. Could that alone cause a significant performance difference between the Pentium and the K6? To understand this further, we need to look at the x87 extensions in more detail. But first, a quick overview of floating point versus integer numbers. As we all know, numbers in a computer are stored as a series of bits that can be either 1 or 0. We can group these bits together to form numbers. Here's an example of an 8-bit number, where each bit corresponds to an increasing power of 2. How this number gets interpreted depends entirely on the software and what instruction is being executed. For example, this number can be a 9 in hexadecimal 169 as an unsigned integer, negative 87 as a signed integer, or the copyright symbol in ASCII. 
When dealing with numbers, they can generally be broken down into two types, integer and floating point. Integer numbers are whole numbers, which can be signed or unsigned, and are useful for counting things like loop iterations or number of elements in a list. Floating point on the other hand is for decimal numbers that contain an integer part and a fractional part. These are described in terms of scientific notation with a fractional part and an exponent, allowing for them to cover a much larger range of values than would otherwise be possible with integers. But because of this complexity, you either need complicated software that runs slow, or complicated hardware to do it quicker. And this is why CPUs have floating point units as math coprocessors. The first floating point hardware for the x86 processor was the 8087, introduced in 1980. This was a floating point coprocessor, which was a separate chip from the main 8086 CPU. This coprocessor defined the floating point instructions for the x86 instruction set, and was hence called the x87 floating point extensions. The x87 extensions defined an 8 entry register stack, which could be pushed to, popped from, or have elements swapped. All of the register references, however, were in relation to the top of the stack, and therefore the entries were not fixed like with the x86 registers, or with RISC registers like what ARM uses. This led to a computational bottleneck, known as the top of stack bottleneck, which was caused by the top of stack entry needing to be constantly moved around and duplicated. On top of the normal floating point operations like add and multiply, x87 also implemented transcendental functions like sine, cosine, tangent, and exponent. This was done through series approximation by way of microcode in the 8087, but saved in program space and instruction bandwidth, in addition to being substantially faster due to tighter coupling to the hardware. And since this extension is stack-based, all of the operations use the ST0 entry along with another stack register specified by the instruction encoding, and right back to the ST0 register. Similarly, transcendental operations use the ST0 register and right back to the ST0 register. In both cases, the operations are destructive, often requiring excess stack duplication. To solve this problem, enter the floating point exchange instruction. All it does is swap the value in ST0 with any of the other stack entries. This instruction allows you to build up arbitrary combinations of registers within the stack, treating it almost identically to a fixed register file, which can greatly improve performance. Except for one issue, it's another instruction, which is more work for the FPU, which takes more time to execute, and therefore programs can run slower when using FExchange. Intel knew that FExchange was necessary to help the top of stack bottleneck and came up with a way to make this instruction effectively free in the Pentium. To do this, the FExchange instruction could execute in parallel to most other floating point instructions, which gave floating point on the Pentium the same register flexibility as with the integer instructions. Quake made explicit use of this behavior in its floating point code, which effectively increased the floating point throughput by a factor of two. AMD did not fare quite as well. Not only was the K6 decode limited, but it was also floating point execution limited. The K6 had two short decoders which would be needed to achieve the same throughput as the Pentium. However, only the first short decoder could decode floating point instructions, or they would have to be decoded by the long or vector decoder at a rate of one per cycle. This means that the floating point and F exchange pairing would take two cycles to decode. AMD's rationale was that the F exchange instruction wasn't really needed and that their memory access was fast enough, so you should just use memory direct operations instead. This was further compounded by the fact that most compilers around the time didn't use the F exchange instruction that often, and it was only really used for hand optimized assembly. Unfortunately, Quake made extensive use of hand optimized assembly. AMD later corrected this mistake in their CXT revision, which moved the F exchange instruction from taking two cycles into taking zero cycles. Either way, this isn't the end of the story, since F exchange alone wouldn't account for the entire performance difference, and it wasn't enough to boost performance on the Pentium to the required level. Given that the F exchange instruction couldn't account for the entire performance difference between the Pentium and K6, something else must be going on. While it was easy to dismiss the other performance optimizations as working on both processors, maybe that doesn't tell the complete story. The next optimization point was the superscalar integer pipeline in the Pentium. Here is a comparison of the Pentium MMX and the AMD K6. The Pentium MMX was chosen since it is a little closer to the K6 than the Pentium P5 due to the included instruction queue. Both processors follow the same tradition order of fetch, decode, and execute, with the differences increasing as you go further down the pipeline. The fetch stages on both processors is essentially identical, and their decode stages are also similar. Both processors could only decode up to two simple instructions per cycle. They also both had two ALUs, which could execute both instructions in parallel. 
so the two processors appear to be evenly matched. Therefore, this wasn't one of the possible causes for the performance difference. We can at least cross the integer pipeline pairing off the list of potential causes. The only two remaining optimizations are again related to the floating point unit. So what about floating point performance in general? The first question to ask is, what is a floating point unit? To answer that, we can look to the original 8087. This was a math coprocessor which could do floating point computations in hardware. It consisted of three main parts. A bus interface, since this was its own ship, it needed a way to talk to the 8086 processor and the attached memory. Then there was the control and register section, which was responsible for conducting the operations like the conductor of an orchestra. This section also housed the eight floating point stack registers. And finally the compute section, which was where all of the math was actually done. We can compare this to the floating point unit on the Pentium. There's a similar structure where the Pentium floating point unit contains similar control circuitry and the stack registers. It also contains a compute section, but implements more complete function units so that different operations can overlap at the same time. There's no bus interface section though, because the Pentium FPU was integrated into the CPU and therefore didn't need one. In comparison, the floating point function unit in the AMD K6 looked more like this, where all of the floating point operations were implemented in a shared execution unit. This allowed the common resources used by each operation to be shared, at the cost of not being able to execute the operations in parallel. Additionally, the control unit and register file were moved out of the execution unit and made part of the rest of the larger processor. So effectively, the floating point execution unit in the K6 was a simpler module that took in two operands and output a single result, as opposed to a fully self-contained floating point unit. The consequence of this difference can be seen by breaking down the different types of floating point operations into small operations, or microops, and seeing how the two pipelines compared. Here's a list of the different types of x87 floating point instructions and what micro operations they can decompose into. Register to register instructions break down into floating point math micro operations. But register and memory instructions require a load from memory as well. While the Pentium could execute one floating point math operation per cycle, it had to serialize loads from memory, thus making the total throughput two cycles for such a case. In comparison, the AMD K6 could execute a load in parallel if it belonged to another instruction, which is part of the out-of-order execution nature of the K6. The floating point execution portion of the K6 on the other hand, required two cycles for every operation. The end result is that for register-to-register -register floating point instructions, the Pentium was faster, but for memory-to-register floating point instructions, they were equally matched. This is the exact case that AMD used to justify their lack of floating point execution unit pipelining. In reality, it's impossible to only use register-to-register -register floating point instructions, and Quake was no exception to this. So the overall performance difference due to this pipelining or lack thereof wasn't a major contributing factor with Quake. And that just leaves one last optimization to look into, the integer and floating point overlapping. Since the K6 is an out-of-order execution processor, this was an obvious feature. But maybe there's more to the story. The first question would be, how can integer and floating point execution overlap in the first place? If you look back at the block diagrams, you can see that both processors have distinct pipeline paths. The Pentium has two integer pipelines and one floating point pipeline, while the AMD K6 has two integer pipelines, a load pipeline, a store pipeline, and a floating point pipeline. Given that resources are not shared across the pipelines, you can have an instruction in each of these paths simultaneously. So that's where you get the overlap from. Clearly, both processors can do this, so what's going on? The answer lies entirely with the floating point division, which was the exact use case in Quake. Here, the floating point divide was used to calculate perspective correction in textures during software rendering. But division takes a while for both floating point and integers. On the Pentium, it took 19 cycles and 21 cycles on the AMD K6. When accounting for the processor pipelines of the Pentium, this effectively means that the Pentium would have to stop executing instructions for 16 cycles while it waited for the division to complete. This was because the Pentium executed the instructions in program order and would need to wait for the result from the division before it could continue executing instructions. But this would have been terrible for performance, and Intel knew this. So, Intel added some early exception logic to the floating point unit on the Pentium, which allowed for the instructions that followed to continue executing. As long as you don't actually need the division result right away, and you know it's not going to cause an error such as division by zero, then the Pentium could just happily spend those 16 cycles computing the division in parallel to any integer execution.
This does mean that any floating point instructions in that 16 cycles would cause the processor to stall, but all of the texture lookup and filtering code in the Quake software renderer used fixed point integer math, so that wasn't a problem. The end result was that the floating point division instruction effectively took one cycle on the Pentium, as long as you didn't need the result right away. So what about the K6? Well, the K6 didn't implement this early exception logic, but because it was an out-of-order execution processor, it could still continue to execute integer instructions in parallel. But this behavior is what led to its downfall. The K6 could issue and commit micro-operations at a rate of 4 per cycle. This means that the instructions are done and the program state is updated. This is in comparison to 2 micro-operations per cycle on the Pentium. But the floating point division can't be committed until it's done, effectively acting as a barrier. So this means that while the Pentium is happily working on integer instructions, the K6 is building up a backlog of micro-operations to commit. Then once the Pentium finishes the floating point division, it can begin working on new work while the K6 needs to clear its built-up queue. Luckily the K6 could commit two more micro-operations per cycle than the Pentium, so it has a hope of clearing the queue and breaking even. Except for one major problem. The scheduling queue in the K6 was limited to 24 micro-operations, which was arranged as six rows of four micro-operations, or opquads. Micro-operations also had to commit at the granularity of an opquad, and you couldn't always fill all four entries. So in practice, the K6 would rarely commit four micro-operations per cycle, and would rarely be able to fully utilize the scheduler entries. On top of that, 24 micro-operations isn't enough slots to cover the 19 cycles of delay. So this is what the scheduler would likely look like, where the floating point division operation is the orange micro-op in quad 1. The end result being, only a total of 12 instructions can fit in the scheduler, including the floating point division. Then the K6 will have to stall and stop executing code 6 cycles after the floating point division instruction, and this stall will last for the remaining 14 cycles. That's 14 cycles where the Pentium is still happily executing instructions. This is no small performance penalty. We can even look at some of the Quake software rendering code and figure out what micro-operations are used, what the scheduler looks like, and the exact instruction where the execution would stall. It's quite ironic that the very thing that made the K6 special ended up leading to its downfall in the specific case of Quake. To help verify these claims, we can once again look at a software rendering benchmark. This is a comparison with the Quake 2 software rendering demo in 640x480. Quake 2 was chosen as it was also compared on the later K6 processors. Additionally, the software rendering code in Quake 2 is almost identical if not identical to the code used by the original Quake game. Since the benchmarks did not all have the same frequency, the results were normalized to 233 MHz, and then again normalized to the performance of the 233 MHz Pentium MMX. A value of 1.0 means that the performance per MHz is identical to the 233 MHz Pentium MMX. The main division in the K6 families are the K6-2 processors, which use the CXT core, and the K6-2 Plus and K6-3 Plus which both use the third generation ST core. This is relevant, since the CXT supposedly introduced a fix for the floating point exchange instruction to take zero cycles instead of two cycles. And the ST core supposedly introduced an early exception checker for the floating point division instruction. This means that this scheduling stall caused by the floating point division was not present in the ST core variants. And we can clearly see that the performance per megahertz improved greatly after the floating point division fix, being identical to the Pentium for the 256K L2 cache variant. If the problem was overall floating point pipeline performance, we should expect to see this being less than 1.0, so that was likely the major cause of the performance difference. One thing to note is that the 128K L2 variant didn't quite match the performance of the Pentium but that was likely due to the extreme L2 cache sensitivity, which can be seen with the other K6-2 processors. Either way, improved cache performance wouldn't be enough to overcome the processor stalling for 14 cycles during every floating point division, so that is unlikely to be the source of speed up here. In summary, the floating point exchange pairing optimization may have resulted in a performance hit for the K6 compared to the Pentium, but it was likely minor. The superscalar integer pairing was unlikely to be related to the performance difference with Quake, especially since the K6 was stronger at integer execution. The lack of pipelining in the floating point function unit would have caused a small performance hit, but that was likely mitigated by the high usage of memory to register floating point instructions. And finally, the integer floating point overlap with floating point division stalled the K6 scheduler, resulting in many cycles of the processor not making forward progress, while it waited for the floating point division to complete.
This was likely the biggest factor for the performance difference running Quake on the K6 compared to the Pentium, but was fixed in a later K6 revision. There you have it, what's normally brushed off as a pipeline floating point unit difference, or as simpler overlapping integer and floating point execution, is a lot more complicated when you start to look into it. This was a shortened version of a longer video that goes into much more detail. If you want to see more analysis or detail into the different points, with a more in-depth analysis of the instructions used by Quake, you should check out that video. Anyway, hopefully you found this interesting. Thanks for watching.